welcome to episode 39 of the Monday Night Review. I'm coming to you with yet another cold. What is happening, immune system? It was just, it was just a snotty, horrible cold until uh, Saturday, where I just slept for hours and yesterday, which seems nice, but I'm still feeling pretty weird, so... I'm not not thrilled by it, but I have been elbow deep in this week's episode because it's completely fascinating. As often happens, I started off doing something else, ended up on a completely different topic. This one is really fascinating and especially good if you enjoyed the strange disappearance of Matthias Kowecki. It's kind of similar, but not at all similar. I started writing this thinking that I had done basically all my research. I'd dipped in and out of it before, so I'd read quite a lot about it. And I frankly thought it was going to be a cinch to write. But then I found a great seven, seven episode podcast on BBC Sounds it's got interviews with family and witnesses and so it's really worth a listen if you like this and you want to deeper dive into the case it's called the strange death of Innes Ewart which is what this episode was going to be called until I found this podcast so <laughs> that's why we're calling it something else but yeah it's on BBC Sounds if you search for that and it's really interesting and I love I love a, a podcast that's a series so you can kind of get into it but also get to the end so this is what we're going to talk about the strange death of Innes Ewart we're in Inverness in the Scottish Highlands on the 22nd of January 2001 Pat and Ron Ewart awoken at 4am there are police at the door telling them that the body of their son Innes has been found but it's a mistake, surely, because 27-year-old Innes has been living and working in Germany for the past six months. He speaks to his mother regularly. He'd actually spoken to the family the day before for two hours. She would know if they were back in the UK. He would have mentioned if he was thinking of coming home. So she calls him, gets no answer. She emails him, obviously no answer. Police tell her that his passport and bank cards have been found on the body and that they have identified him using the photograph in his passport. They are confident that it's their son, and they believe that he committed suicide. If you can hear the clacking of of dog nails, that's Magda. She's my glamorous assistant today. So let's go back a bit. Inez is the eldest of the four Ewart children. He's 27 at the time of his death. He is a computer studies graduate and he works as a computer programmer, moved to Munich to work at Philips Analytica in 2000 after he struggled to find employment in Scotland. He was incredibly clever, friendly. He wasn't frightened of anything. He was really interested in the sort of all aspects of life, architecture, how the world worked he was he was incredibly bright and switched on his colleagues in munich said that he was excellent at his job and though he was one week away from completing his six month probation he'd been told that he'd passed with flying colors and he'd be offered a full contract including a pay rise and he was really happy about that he had a girlfriend a good salary and when he returned to work from his christmas break three weeks before He'd been incredibly happy and pleased to be back at work and his mother knew that he was homesick and his relationship with his girlfriend, it was new and he, I don't think he was convinced that it was going anywhere. She seems to have been a bit up and down herself, but there was nothing fundamentally terribly wrong. So he loved his job. He had no money worries. He was close to his family and friends. He enjoyed living in Munich, and when his family visited, he was showing them around the city, showing them all the different architecture and all the places to go. He seemed really settled. The day before the police arrived on their doorstep, the Ewarts had chatted happily to him for over two hours on the computer. He got a pasta recipe from his brother, who was training as a chef. He was close to all his siblings, and they were unaware of anything bothering him. 
So it just seemed really weird for him to suddenly appear in a different city dead. Throughout his time at university, the only thing that ever troubled him was homesickness. And when it struck, he would sometimes appear at home unannounced, spend some days at home and then go back. But things were clearly not what they seemed. When Innes is told that his job is to be made permanent, he doesn't tell his family. He packs his belongings in his flat, wipes his computer, withdraws £1,000 and gets a plane for London. It's the equivalent of £5,000. He withdraws money in marks and then he withdraws money from his Scottish bank account. So he withdraws this. He gets on a plane to London. It could be that the cash is to buy a plane ticket. He didn't have a credit card a last minute plane ticket then from Munich to London would have been about £500. So it could be literally that he just wanted a good whack of cash to get from Munich to Inverness with some spending money. At 6pm that evening, he calls his friend James, who he was friends with from university. They were quite close. And James's wife takes the message. She says to James, it sounds urgent. But James has been traveling for work. He's really exhausted. He doesn't return the call. And it's believed that James is the last person that Innes tries to contact before he leaves Germany. But that's all we have until his body is found at the bottom of a multi-story car park in Stratford in East London. So police have CCTV footage of the lift entrance to the top open rooftop car park above the Stratford shopping centre, which is where Innes is believed to have jumped from. The camera on the eighth floor shows Innes coming out of the lift alone, walking straight through the, the landing doors to the car park, that's all. There are no CCTV cameras on the rooftop itself. And in these short frames, he seems neither anxious nor hurried. It's actually almost a problem because the police say he's moving with purpose. And that implies that he had determined to kill himself. And that's why he was moving with a purpose. His mother, when she sees the t- CCTV footage, said... He always moved with purpose. He was was unafraid of life. He was interested and excited about life and always moved with purpose. And, and that was how he walked. The tape records this time at, as 1454. At 1500 hours, Innes is found dying by shop workers below. The police later said there's no signs of struggle. And the CCTV shows no one else arriving or leaving. By 1745 that day, police had wrapped up the scene, concluding that Innes had killed himself. Now, I should say that although I think the police handled this case badly, I don't think it's a wrong conclusion to jump to. As they say, the CCTV footage, he's on his own. He's acting erratically. He hasn't told family or friends his plans. As far as his family are aware... He's in Munich with his girlfriend. He was supposed to meet his girlfriend that Saturday. She had no idea that he was planning to visit London. He has no friends or family in London. Um, So I can see why the police would hop to the conclusion that he must have jumped. But they should still have investigated this case properly. And Innes's mother, Pat could not accept that her son would have killed himself. She had a conversation with her husband where he said, you need to really think about it and really think about whether it's a possibility or if we are tormenting ourselves that something else happened to protect ourselves from this thought that our son could have killed himself. And she said she sat up all night thinking about it, thinking about conversations they'd had and how he'd been through the 27 years that she'd known him. And she said, I actually felt better because I just knew 
that there's no way he would have killed himself. So I will say, obviously people have mental breaks, but why travel all the way from Germany to London to jump off the top of a car park in a really dodge area? Why that car park? Why, when you know no one in that area, would you go there? Innes's mother asked the police for the gold watch that they had given him for Christmas three weeks before that he was never without, and the police said he wasn't wearing it. Pat and Ron then discover that he's withdrawn all this money from his German and Scottish bank accounts, and yet no money was found on the body. What they did find in his pockets was also strange. They found a booking for a hotel the night before, the Saturday night when he'd arrived in London, but he hadn't stayed in that hotel. Where had he stayed? They found a tube ticket that he had bought at Stratford Station. The bodies found in Stratford. The ticket had been used at the barriers, but the journey had gone no further. He'd put the ticket through the barrier, taken the ticket. Anyone who's been on the tube, if you haven't been on the tube... You literally feed it into a hole, it checks it, you pull it out and it opens the gates. So you have your ticket. So he seems to have done this, but not gone through the gates, not gone on the tube. He, this tube ticket that he's bought is a single to central London, but he goes back out of the tube station into the car park. Most interestingly, Innes has purchased a cinema ticket at the nearby Stratford Picture House He's bought the ticket at 1427. The film was due to start at 1445 that afternoon, 15 minutes before he was found dying. Who buys a cinema ticket and then goes to kill themselves, his family asks. A police officer was dispatched to seize and collect any CCTV footage in and around the cinema. The officer said that he was told by staff that the recorded footage inside the foyer was available, but they had the staff had no access to it until the manager was there. So the policeman asked for it to be kept and it would be collected later, but the tape was never picked up. The manager, however, says he spoke to a policeman and he was told to keep the footage in case someone wanted to see it, but he was then never contacted again. Later on, the cinema security guard comes forward. He recalls that that afternoon he saw a man in in his early 30s, perhaps, outside the cinema in a very agitated state, who at one stage threw a jacket in the bin before retrieving it. Was it Innes? We we won't know. He I, I don't know if he was shown a picture to identify, whether he couldn't identify the picture. Again... There probably was CCTV footage outside the cinema that was never checked. But also, why on earth, if he is not going to commit suicide, why on earth are you going to the top floor of a car park in Stratford? It's not a lovely area. Even in the nicest areas of London, of London the, the top floor of a multi-story car park is often not a great place to hang out. And if you're visiting London and you might want to see the sights and go somewhere that you've maybe heard of friends saying they've been to or whatever, Stratford is not a tourist spot in 2001. It's empty factories, a huge crime scene. It's pre-Olympics. Stratford now is a world away from what it was in 2001. It is completely different and it was not somewhere that you used to go as a tourist or to hang out for the day because you had a day in London on on your way home it just seems such a bizarre choice of place for him to go his best friend James his brother lived there for a while and his parents wonder if in his was therefore had an interest sparked knowing that his brother's friend had lived in Stratford and wanted to go and check it out. I believe that a massive problem with this case is the language used by the police. With When the dispatch call comes in and they have the transcript of the dispatch call, it says mail has jumped from the multi-story car park. So within three hours, they've decided that Innes has committed suicide by jumping from the top floor. The police never go to the top floor. 
The crime scene log is incomplete. There are actions the police have said they've carried out, but it hasn't been logged and they don't remember doing it. The information from the forensics officer shows that there wasn't a policeman in charge at the scene to tell him what happened and and what procedures they wanted to follow. There's just a junior police officer there when the forensic guy arrives and no call has gone through to the officer in charge. Though interestingly, on the forensics form where they put what what they're investigating the forensic investigator has put suspicious death and not suicide so but the forensics carried out was not adequate they remove Innes's shoe to try and match it to a footprint found on the second floor and it's not a match no fingerprints are taken and this is believed to be because it was damp weather apparently it was raining it is january in london but forensics professional forensics have said that this decision should have been made with a senior police officer and the decision should have been to preserve the crime scene as in the actual crime scene not where the body was but where they believed the body to have come from so the eighth floor They should have covered it with a tent, allowed it to dry naturally, and the fingerprints would still have been present and available. And it would have been really interesting to know whether there was no fingerprints from Innes on the railing, which would tie in with the suicide. If there were fingerprints on the railing from inside the the car park, which would imply maybe a struggle or if there were fingerprints even and handprints implying that he had gone over and was holding on, or if there were his fingerprints with the third parties, which would indicate maybe a struggle, but nothing was taken. The police never went to the eighth floor. The The body is the crime scene, yes, but the, the primary crime scene is where whatever happened happened, and that is the eighth floor. and. The police never went there. The police say they have the evidence that he was there because they have the CCTV footage. He was walking with a purpose. There was no one else on the CCTV, so they don't bother to go and investigate. Seven months after his death, Walthamstow Coroner's Court delivers an open verdict, which is reassuring because that means there's not enough evidence to confirm that it is a suicide but unsatisfactory for the family because they don't know what happened to their son. On the day of the inquest, the parents are finally taken to the car park to see for themselves where Innes has died. The car park is open to the elements and affords a panoramic view of the surrounding area. But it's not at all as described to the U.S. by the police. They, they said it was completely different to what they expected and how it had been described. And then according to the U.S., the police officer who was with them, who had been at the crime scene that day, blurted out that it was the first time that he'd been to the top floor. The U.S. wonder if any proper forensic inspection had taken place that day. And, and as we find out, it hadn't. More happens that day as they walk back over the route that Innes had taken that day from the tube station to the cinema to the car park, they are astounded by the amount of CCTV cameras there are. From the moment Innes has left Stratford tube station to the short walk across the concrete plaza to the cinema, through the shopping mall leading to the lift in the car park, his every step would have been recorded by CCTV The police maintain that it would have taken a disproportionate use of time and resources to check this. But because he bought his tube ticket, because he bought the cinema ticket, and because we have the CCTV of him coming out of the lift on the eighth floor, we have very definite time signatures for when everything happened. They wouldn't be scrolling through hours and hours of CCTV footage It should be minutes of CCTV footage because we know exactly where he was at certain times. And it would have been incredibly interesting to see, was he being followed? Was he with someone that then 
had disappeared by the time he got to the eighth floor. Ron, in as his father, maintains that it was a rainy Sunday and they just couldn't be bothered to do anything. And I feel like maybe there is an element of truth to that. The senior police officer that day had only instructed officers to seize footage from the cinema and the car park. And as we know, they never actually looked at the the CCTV from the cinema. So Innes's parents order their lawyers to issue a formal complaint against the police. And after repeated requests for the Freedom of Information Act, they get hold of all the police info regarding the case, 300 pages of it. And they discover that the forensics team didn't go up to the top floor and they basically found him assumed suicide and didn't bother doing any other checks. As for the CCTV footage or lack thereof, this information is also contradictory because in an internal Metropolitan Review of the investigation in February 2002, it says that CCTV footage within the mall was checked but was negative. But by the time another internal investigation has done a report in May 2003, this has changed. The officer in charge said that since the circumstances seemed non-suspicious, that non-suspicious, there was no necessity to check the CCTV from numerous cameras in the shopping centre. So it seems to be really contradictory. And it's logged that two officers received formal advice from a commanding officer for their failings, which means... Someone got a verbal slap on the wrist. Suspiciously, the pocket notebooks of the two officers on the scene and the incident management log from the day were lost prior to the inquest. And it emerged that many of the officers who attended the scene that day had little if no training on securing and investigating an actual crime scene. They themselves said they'd never done anything like this before and there was no one to tell them what to do. So this is where journalist Mick Morton steps in. He, of the podcast Strange Death of Innes Ewart, he's been trying to piece together the missing 36 hours in London. So he discovers that there's a couple canoodling on the seventh floor and they hear a scream as Innes falls over and they describe it as a wail and filled with fear, not anger. So he also speaks to the poor Sainsbury's worker who finds Innes, who's outside, and he too hears the whale. They both use the term whale, which I think is really interesting, and described again that it's filled with fear rather than anger, and he describes the, the loud thud of the as the body hits the floor. And Innes is still alive when he's found, but he dies less than an hour after arriving at the hospital. Morton also tracks down some other interesting information that you don't get when you're reading up about this case. Innes has left a bag in a locker at Euston Station. Now, Euston Station, for those who are not familiar with British geography, London has loads of stations. Obviously, where you want to go will depend on which station you choose. And to get to Inverness... You go from Euston Station. Now, you can take a day train, but his family believe that he went to book a sleeper. So a sleeper, as the name implies, is the train you sleep on. And they only run on the Sunday night. There was no sleeper on Saturday. So his family believe he went to Euston to check the sleeper. And when he realised it wasn't until the next day, he put his bag in a locker though he doesn't seem to have bought a ticket for the sleeper. So again, this is speculation. His sister, the reason, you know, again, it would seem like, well, if you're determined to go home, why wouldn't you just get the first train home? But his sister had got a day train back to Inverness after her honeymoon and had apparently said it was just the worst thing ever and that they should never do it and the only thing to do was to get the sleeper. So it's probable that he wasn't in a rush. He knew where he was going And he thought, well, I'll just have a night in London and get the sleeper on Sunday. Innes then booked a hotel in Hoban for the night, but never stayed there. And again, this seems really odd. But when Pat Hewitt spoke to the police, the police said it was in a dodgy 
area of London and it was a rough hotel and he would never have stayed here. So Pat believes that maybe Innes had booked the hotel for the night and then arrived and changed his mind and decided he he didn't want to stay there. But but the thing is, we never find out where he did stay. We don't know if, I'm assuming they didn't, anyone checked with nearby hotels that maybe looked a bit nicer or in a better area. No, the, no one seems to have come forward and say said when pictures of Inners were circulated, no one said, yep, he stayed at our hotel. Also, what was an item listed as being found on his person was a mysterious piece of paper with phone numbers on which again was something that disappeared before the inquest. And there's no mention of whether the police called any of these numbers, what these numbers were about or who they were to call. So we don't know what that was and why that's gone missing. Now, of course, you can never rule out a mental break or an episode that would have cause someone who is living a seemingly happy life and in, and enjoying their life to become suicidal but speaking to the family it just seems that there are so many indicators that that just don't add up and one is that when he was younger when his sister was a teenager she was in hospital for a few weeks to have a back operation and Inez at the time was living near the hospital so he visited her most evenings and she was talking to Innes and the surgeon that had operated on her had spent the previous night operating on a girl who had attempted to kill herself by jumping from a building. She had survived, but she had terrible damage to her back and legs and was never going to walk again. And Innes and his sister were talking about this and he said why on earth would you jump from a building to kill yourself because the chances are you just end up a lot worse than when you started out and his sister was like he was just so down on that way of choosing to do it I guess is how you could put it that you know she said it just never never for a second did she believe that he would then choose to do the same thing so what if he was mugged he had this big wadge of cash and a gold watch. Pat believes also that he uh, had a smaller bag with him. So he had his big bag that would have all his stuff in. And then he always had a smaller backpack that he carried with him. And this has never been found. And he's not wearing it in the CCTV footage. Did he follow his mugs up to the roof and it ended with a struggle? The watch has never been found. The bag's never been found. This doesn't seem to bother the police at all. So locals and witnesses at the time say that that car park was a no-go area for anyone not in the criminal world or up to no good, especially the eighth floor. So the couple that are canoodling in the car on the seventh floor who hear in a scream when he falls were up there avoiding her parents who didn't approve of this relationship. That is where they would go to get some privacy but the eighth floor is known as a place for gang members and criminals they would have an easy view of the surrounding area there's no cctv footage up there and no one goes up there so according to an ex-gang member it was never empty there were always people up there doing drugs doing drug deals if they'd stolen a car they would take the car up to the eighth floor to abandon it because they knew that no one would check up there and anyone who was up there wouldn't ask any questions there's also this rumor that goes round a missing cctv tape that apparently shows a young scots guy being walked through the shopping center by a gang of around four youths but again we never see this and we know that he's alone in the, C in the car park CCTV. And the thing is, we'll never know what happened unless someone confesses, which is unlikely. But I can piece together what I think may have happened. I do not think that he committed suicide. I believe that he bought his cinema ticket or he bought his train ticket and somebody saw that he had 500 quid or whatever, a wedge of cash in his wallet and he had a bag and he had a gold watch and they decided that 
they're going to mug him. Whether he is then marched through the mall to a dark area where they can get his stuff from him. There's apparently a, a very dodgy bit around the back of the cinema. And they take his stuff. I think if it's him outside the cinema throwing his coat into a bin, he's pissed off and frustrated and he takes off and he throws it in the bin and then he decides, having seen where the muggers are going, to the eighth floor in the car park, which is right opposite the cinema, they decide he's he decides to go and get his stuff back, which his parents say he absolutely would do. He was not a stacked guy. But he knew judo and he had a very strong sense of right and wrong. And that's my stuff that you've taken and it's not okay. So the ex-gang member said that going up there would be like a lamb to slaughter. That there would be no mercy. So I think he went up to get his stuff. uh, Approached them to get his stuff and they either threw him over the side or there was a struggle and he fell. I wonder if the police knew more than they let on. Whether they didn't want to go to the eighth floor, whether they were intimidated. The the crime at the time there was full on and a lot. Mugging happened all the time. They say that he went up alone and no one went before him or after him. But we know from speaking to people that there were people up on that eighth floor most of the time. Was it because it was a Sunday and the police team involved were inexperienced? As they had said themselves, they didn't have experience in in the crime scene. And then everything just slipped dramatically through the net. And, And when the initial call comes through and says man has thrown himself off the car park, they don't have the experience to question the initial implication that this is suicide. There's seemingly no one in charge properly, no one to direct the forensics team, evidence is lost, the crime scene's mismanaged and it's impossible to claw it back. You can't go back now 18 years later and try to, 20 years later, you can't go back now 20 years later to try to find any evidence, it's gone. So unless someone comes forward we'll never know what happened my heart really goes out to his family to lose a child and a sibling is unthinkable but to have a case this confusing and complicated to have your child die in a car park in a bad area of a city hundreds of miles away with no explanation and no reason and and the people you believe are there to help you not really showing an interest it it haunts them to this day and i'm sure it will do for the rest of their lives and that is the unexplained death of Inez Ewart. I tried to get as much information in there as possible. It's really, really hard to understand what drew Inez to Stratford, what drew him to the eighth floor. I believe he meant to go and see the film. I believe that he got mugged. Maybe he bought the ticket, had 15 minutes to spare, was going to go and do something and got mugged. And went to get his stuff back. I, I I just don't believe that he jumped willingly. Thanks to everyone for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I'm sorry it was quite dark. Um, as always, you can contact us on the Monday Night Review. Uh, we have a blog, Facebook, Instagram. You can buy me a coffee. Just wherever you search, it's the Monday Night Review. Remember that review is spelt R-E-V-U-E. You can find us on Patreon and as always, be kind, stay safe and always check the back seat before you drive. (laughs) 